Okay. Are we on? Hello? Hello? Great. All right. Excellent. Full room almost. That's very good. So for, I think we have now about two-thirds conference goers and one-third others. So um, basically for you guys that weren't part of the conference, uh, this, uh, we've been going all day with uh, academic and some practitioner educators and had, I think, a pretty inspired time in a bunch of uh, different ways. So we're going to use this opportunity to kick off a new program that we, we built at Alto. Uh, I want to make two small points, and then I'll hand over to my colleague Peter Kelly to introduce our, our keynote. Um, we have a website, www.ree.fi. There's live content going up, so a lot of video a lot of Twitter and other stuff, um, blogging. So please, please feel free to look at that. We've also got a LinkedIn group, uh, Re Europe 2012, I believe. So uh, there's been a question: Is is are some of the slides and stuff going to be available? And the answer is yes. Um, I think one or both of those places. Um, so anyway, take a look. Uh, let me hand it over to. Peter Kelly, Peter is uh, absolutely a groundbreaker at Alto, and he's really had a key role in getting this program together, getting the speakers. A lot of this is his network, so uh, we're really indebted to him for that. And I think that he will introduce our keynote speaker here. Thanks. Apparently, I'm supposed to wait for the finger from somebody in the back. And I think there's a lot of my students in here who would like nothing more than to do the finger at time. Are we good to go? Great, great. Um, it's a great pleasure. And if, if I sound like I'm a bit rambling, I've just gotten off a plane from Singapore. Um, we've had an exciting day. We're kicking off tonight a new seminar series that we've, uh, we, any good idea we borrow, beg and steal, and Stanford has something called the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders, and we, our take on this is we're introducing a new lecture series called Changemakers. The appeal being for students in a university where we're supposed to be thinking in new and innovative ways, bringing in provocative speakers for you to be inspired from, to learn a bit from, and start an introspection yourself, what kind of mark you want to make in the world. And with that background, I have to say, I can't think of a better guy to kick this off. Uh, Doug Richard, and if you've taken some of my courses, you may know he's quite a famous guy. Uh, Doug, you were on the first two series of The Dragon's Den, which had a cult following among the BBC. Um, the School of Startups, I think, is one of the most provocative and interesting experiments with real impact going on in the UK. He has vibrant and vigorous discussions with university people who don't want to change. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome him. He's a very busy guy, Doug Richard. Uh, thank you, Peter. Right, before we start, I just need everyone in the whole audience to do me a small favor. Stand up. Huh. Right, now if your last name begins with the letters A through M, humor me, do this. If your last name begins with the letters N through Z or Z, do this, as though you're praying. Don't move. <laughs> Excellent. I can now honestly tell everyone I got another standing ovation. <laughs> As a, you can sit down now. I do that before I start my speeches, because otherwise I can't guarantee the outcome. The definition of entrepreneurship, how to cheat. Right, so who here is a student in one form or another who's just come in for this speech tonight? Raise your hand properly, don't be shy. Right, you're also my volunteers, because that's who I'm addressing this speech to. So of the students in the room, who here has started or is starting or is contemplating starting a business? Raise your hand. OK, now leave your hands up. If you are in that category and you have an idea for a business, leave your hands up. Right, if your hand is up, please stand up. Right. Thank you for volunteering. 
So, amongst the people standing up, you are people who are students, who have an idea or a business. That's how you've defined yourself. I'd like some of you, in the next 45 minutes, to join me on stage to discuss your business. Don't sit down. You've already volunteered. <laughs> now, we have a throwable mic somewhere. Where's my throwable mic? Is it around? Well, throw it. Throw it to anybody you like or dislike who's standing up. Everyone who's standing up, turn around, because somebody's going to throw a mic at you. Go ahead. You have to catch it as well. Right, close enough, well done, nearly caught. What's your name? Okay, in one sentence, please, and this is true for all of you, I'd like you to describe your business. One sentence. With the new kind of media there is, you can find out local news happening around you. Okay, so you're halfway there. Because a business requires revenue and it requires customers, right? But I don't know who the revenue, I can imply it, I can infer, I'm sorry, I can infer it from what you've said. I want you, what, it's Marco? Yes. Marco. Let's try again. So we know that it's a local news service of some form. Who's it for? Uh, <clears throat> we're targeting users, pretty much everyone who now are currently on Facebook or any kind of social media users. But it's a mobile application, so everybody with a smartphone. So you have to have a smartphone, you have to be on Facebook. Presumably those are the predicate technologies. But that's not the customer base, that's a huge superset of the customer base. So who is it you're actually targeting? Whose problem are you solving? What, what, what itch are you scratching? Well, we're targeting, <clears throat> we have like three different stakeholders. We have users who are like, users who like to read, for example, news with smartphones, which is pretty much 50% uh, of the people using smartphones, and it's a growing, growing trend. And then we have uh, our customers who are like companies who might be able, uh, willing to display advertisements that are focused locally uh, to the people who are reading the news. And then we have the news medias who um, are willing to <coughs> uh, get statistics of what people would like to read about. So let me just see if I can recapitulate it back to you. You tell me how close I am, okay? You're going to deliver a groundbreaking new service that collates and aggregates local news for the benefit of all of the younger generation who are primarily dependent on information and socialization through Facebook and smartphones and redistribute it and take advantage of gathering up that audience for the benefit of advertisers who want to reach them. <laughs> Is that what you said? Well, well, if, when you say it in one sentence, it sounds complicated, but something... That may be, but I, it's, sometimes it's hard. But you can, I do truly believe you can get every business down to a sentence. All I'm asking is, is that what you said? Is that what you meant? Is that the business? You're gathering up an audience. You're selling access to the audience. You're going to gather up the audience by finding somehow some wonderful way to gather up local news that's around me, that's pertinent, that's daily, deliver it to a local wired group of generally young people, because that's the age demographic that's implied by Facebook intersect smartphones, and you're going to sell that access to the audience to advertisers, right? Yeah. yeah that's okay, so I just said it in a longer sentence. <laughs> cool. Right. First of all, a round of applause to Marco. Thank you very much for being a guinea pig. Do you know anybody else who's standing up that you'd like to pick on now? Hand them the mic. OK. That's one approach. Um, I do love this throwing the mic thing. Yeah, I don't like him. Woo! Apparently, he wants you to volunteer. Apparently, Everybody yeah. else, all you have to do is what Marco and I did and save me the time. What's your name? Frank. Brent? Frank. OK. I can't pronounce anything. Um, why don't you describe your business or business idea? All you have to do is get the whole thing in one sentence. We are solving a dust problem uh, on con construction sites. I'm sorry, say that again slower for dust those of us who speak American. <laughs> on construction sites. What problem? Dust. You know, oh, the dust problem. Yeah. You solve the dust problem. How do you solve the dust problem? Because uh, construction sites are pretty dusty. I know. And uh, we're just building some uh, equipment for that. What does the equipment do? Uh, basically, there's like two ways. 
you can like uh, suck and take away the dust away in, in a way. You can either so suck the dust away or the source, or you can like create a barrier or something, you know, just you know to uh, not let it escape from, from certain places. Okay, so do I understand correctly the problem you're actually solving is not the problem of dust on construction sites, but the problem of dust escaping from construction sites? Yeah, basically, yeah. Well, they're not the same. Well, actually, one gets rid of the dust, one contains the dust, which yeah, yeah, is but, but there, there's like two ways, you know. You one gets rid of it, yeah, one yeah, contains yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know. What, what, for whom are you solving the problem? The people on this site or the people near this site? Uh, for, the, for the workers, you know. Uh, so it's the people on this site. Yeah, on the side, Therefore, yeah. containing it wouldn't solve it because they'd be inside the box, wouldn't they? Yeah. So that's not the pr approach you're taking, I take no, it. No. You're going to take uh, the dust away. Yep. Okay, and what are you going to, how are you going to do that? You gonna suck it up with a big Darth Vader gun? What? Just tell me. Well, we have some, you know, you know, there's IPR thing, you know. We are just. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, fair enough. I don't want to ask you to reveal something that you don't want to reveal, but that does make it difficult to use you as an example. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, it's, it's a secrecy issue. <laughs> but we could have a discussion later on about how you should never bother keeping secrets. Okay. Because at the end of the day, ideas are deeply cheap. It's the execution of ideas that make a difference. And you gain more as a rule from the sharing of ideas from not, but unfortunately that gets clouded by patent questions, and so I don't want to give that advice. Right, for who else is a, a lot, who's standing up who'd like to share their idea? Right, would you hand him the mic? Last one before we move on. That's fine, whoever catches Hello. it. Hello. What's your name? My name is Lawley. Hey. I knew that, okay. <laughs> and, uh, we are, with SUI, we are NetMedi and creating a communication and analytics platform for cancer care. Communication and, uh, I'm sorry, a communication and analytics platform? Yeah, for doctors, patients, and nurses in cancer care. What problem are you solving? Uh, we are solving the problem that at the moment doctors and patients are communicating through emails and phones where all the, all the data is not st structured nor saved during this long-term long illness. And at the, at the moment, we are, we are creating this platform together with one of Finland's leading cancer clinics, Docrates, and creating a new way to uh, use all the data which is, which is, uh, which is used in this cancer, cancer treatment, all in all. So you're gathering the data surrounding the patient that's relevant to the doctor, transporting it back to the doctor, and letting the doctor and the other health practitioners then communicate back to the patient in an ongoing way rather than just working on disjointed emails. Yeah, exactly. Well, besides it sounding very cool, that's a pretty good description of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that was a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to say, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're pretty good. Um, no, that, it's very good. There's nothing I could add to it. Um, first of all, thank you very much, everyone. You can sit down. We'll come back to you guys. <laughs> Those of you who are standing up, just ask yourself the question, would you like to join me on stage in a few minutes, okay? And all of those you still want to say yes in a few minutes, please do so. I run an organization called the School for Startups. What we generally, and I'm talking to those of you who are contemplating starting a business, and what we normally do is we run a class. This is what we've done the most of. It's a one-day class that lasts for nine hours. It'd be, and we'll all, we, we make a very modest promise. Our modest promise is we will teach you how to think about your business or business idea. That's it. And what we mean by that is, is that it's my view, and the view of a, lot of, a bunch of other people, I suppose, is that all ideas are not created equal. Some ideas suck. And it's really good to know if your idea is no good before you start your business, rather than after going down the path a long way. I've started seven businesses now, six of which I'm happy to talk to you about. One of them sucked. I wish I'd known before I started that business how bad it was. I didn't have somebody to teach me how to analyze the notion I had. But business is not invention. Business is not for inventors. Business is an act of discovery. And the starting of a business is primarily the act of discovery. What do I mean? I mean you don't invent the price of a product. You discover 
by way of example, the price of a product. I love accountants who help teach people how to start a business and say, right, here's how you're going to price your product. You take the cost of the goods and you take your overheads and you split them up across the number you're going to sell and you attach that to it. Then you add on the profit you'd like to make. I love that sentence, the profit I'd like to make. And then you sum it up and that's your price. No, it's not. That is a wish. Here's how you price. You walk out the door and you say to somebody, will you buy this, Peter? And he says, no, that's not your price. You walk up to a person who's bald, would you like to buy this? And they say, yes, that's your price, unless you sold it for too little. So you add something to it and you go on and on and on. You discover the price in the world. Pricing isn't acting of invention, the pricing is all around you. Pricing is in the hand of the customer. Revenue is in the hand of the customer. You only control costs. Revenue is hoped for, costs are controlled. Business is largely an act of discovery. You have to discover what your business is or could be. But the funny thing about it is you can discover it before you start the business. You just have to ask questions. You have to ask questions of yourself and of the world. And if you learn how to ask the right questions and you learn how to tease out of the world the answers to the questions, you learn a great deal. You learn what kind of business opportunity do I have? Is it going to be a lifestyle business that will generate for me an income so I can do the thing I love for the rest of my life and make a profit from it? Is it a business that could scale to be the size of Google? Is it a business that must scale to be the size of Google in order to be successful? Is it a business that I can start on a dollar? Is it a business that I must start on 10 million? These are all acts of discovery. Therefore, if you want to start a successful business, it's better to be thoughtful about it and discover first what type of business your idea could create. And then along the way, you can shape it into the best it can be. There's lots of opportunity to be creative, not just in the product and service you create, but in the business you wrap around it. And I care far more about the entrepreneurial opportunity, the notion of the business, than I do about the product or service. So over the last 25 years, I've been very fortunate. I've started a bunch of businesses. I was an investor, as an angel investor for a long time. As Peter said, I appeared on a British TV show where I lost a great deal of money. That was an educational experience. And then I went on to become a venture capitalist and I invested other people's money, which was way more fun. I don't know where I was all my life. I take, you know, there's angel investors and there's venture capitalists. An angel investor is a great guy. This is somebody who takes money out of their own back pocket, their own children's inheritance, and gives it to you. And then you go out and lose it for me. That's personalizing it a bit, but that's largely what happens. And every once in a while, you make me a bit of money. And I get older and grayer watching it happen. But if you make money, I make money. If you lose money, I lose money. But if you're a VC, oh my god. You take other people's money, and I give it to you. And if you make money, I make money. And if you lose money, I don't lose anything. Why didn't I know this when I was starting out? Venture capitalists make money for doing nothing. That's true. In fact, the more they do nothing, the more they make. How peculiar is that? It's called two in 20. You make 2% of the money under management for the period of time you manage it, and you make the first 20% of the profit made on all of the money in the fund. Most VCs are VCs for one fund. 75% of all VCs globally are VCs for one fund. Why? Because they never make any money. They just manage it. It's the best scam ever. I recommend it to any of you if you can get a job being a VC. It has nothing to do with being an entrepreneur. Going back to where I was. So I've been quite fortunate. I've been an entrepreneur. I've been a non-exec. I've been an angel investor. I've been a VC. Now I teach this stuff. One of the things I have found across all of my roles, sitting at these different parts of the table, is that the same questions come up over and over and over again. And in fact, it's the same questions. The same questions I ask of myself before any of my great ideas turn out to be terrible, or somebody else's great idea turns out to be terrible. It's the same retinue of questions, the same list you have to go through. So over the years, I've distilled it down to 10 questions. And even the order is significant. Why? Because I'm a lazy guy. If I can make sure I don't ever have to talk to you again in one question that is so much more efficient than waiting through 10. So I want to put the questions in an order that guarantees that whatever is a fatal flaw in the idea, we get to it fast. So when we teach our one-day course, we teach 10 questions. That's it. 10 simple questions to ask. Anybody who wants them, we've got them on our website. We've got them everywhere. We School for Startups does this stuff. It's, they're not a secret. The challenge is answering the question. Question one is, what do you do that people need or want? Isn't that a simple question? 
Every entrepreneur in the world has an answer to this question. Most entrepreneurs suck at answering it. What do you do that people need or want? Now, let me point something out. It doesn't have to solve a problem. It's more than adequate to fulfill a desire. Solving a problem is what do you do that people need. Fulfilling a desire is what do you do that people want. Wants are just as powerful as needs. If you happen to do both, that's wonderful. But I don't care. I don't really give a hoot. Need or want is just fine. All you have to do is be able to answer it. What you were engaging in when you were standing before me a few minutes ago was trying to answer that question. All I asked you is, what do you do? Just answer it in a sentence. What do you do that people need or want? But where, what has to be in the answer? Who do you do what for, for whom, and how, and for what? In other words, what is the quid pro quo? What's the train? Think of all the things you need to know to answer that question effectively. You need to know who your audience is. You need to know what itch you're scratching. You need to know why they're buying it, if they're going to buy it. You need to, the funny thing is, you need to know. If you don't know, you speculate. I'll tell you a quick story about that. So, Many years ago, as Peter mentioned, I appeared on this British TV show called Dragon's Den. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the show, the way it works is five of us would sit on a stage, and we were the dragons, and some of us were successful entrepreneurs, some turned out not to be. Some of us were very wealthy, some turned out not to be. And entrepreneurs, one at a time, would walk up onto this stage, and they'd stand there sweating, frightened, fearful. They'd pitch their business in front of nationwide TV cameras, and sometimes some of us invested, and sometimes some of us didn't. So this one fellow walks up, as is frequently the case, and he stood up, and he said, right, to all five dragons, he said, who here has a dog? And myself and one of the other dragons raised our hands. And he says, well, let me tell you, your dog stinks. I should admit, right up front, if you want to ever get money from me, this is not the best way. <laughs> Insulting my children's dog on national TV is so not guaranteed to get my money. Be that is it may, this is his approach. And he and the other entrepreneur then got into an argument, because weirdly enough, the, 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 the other dragon, Peter, defended the smell of his dog. I thought that was an unwise course of action, but whatever. He said, my dog stinks, but I love it, whatever. I waited till that had died down, and then the fellow went on, because this apparently was a rhetorical question. He shouldn't have actually asked us then, you see. And he said, that's not the point. The point is, I have invented, ah, the word invented. I have invented, he said, a mat, I swore what he said is that it would suck the stink off a dog. Turned out it wasn't so impressive. What he actually said was he'd invented a mat that if your dog sat on the mat, it wouldn't acquire the stink of the dog. Now you may ask yourself, hmm, that's what I asked myself. He called it Maxi Mat. And he said everybody would want one. You see, because the idea, I suppose, was is that you would put the mat in your kitchen, your dog would come in and lie down on the mat, and it wouldn't get the stink of the dog, and therefore when the dog went away, the stink wouldn't be there, and your kitchen would smell lovely, and he was going to charge 50 pounds, 49.99 for maxi mat, loosely translated as about $80. So I asked him a question. I said, who wants one of those? He says, well, just because you don't doesn't mean other people don't. I said, no, but it is one of those rare moments when I am a potential customer. He said, well, there's no other product like it in the world. I said, yes, but just because there's a gap in the market doesn't mean there's a market in the gap. We haven't proved anything yet. I said, even worse, I don't have any evidence that anybody wants. In fact, I went on to say, I actually don't think anybody would want such a ridiculous thing. He said, well, you're not the right kind of customer. He actually fired me as a customer. I didn't know you could, but he fired me as a customer. And I said, fine, fine. I said, but how do you know people want this thing? He then fell into what has to be the most classic bad answer entrepreneurs ever give. In fact, it's such a famous answer, I've given it a name. I call it the ugly baby answer. Because what he said was, I have talked to my family, my friends, everyone I know, and I've shown it to them, and they all think it's wonderful. That's the ugly baby answer. This probably doesn't need explaining, but I shall anyways. <laughs> Pretend for a moment that a young mother walks up to you with her newborn. And it just so happens, it sometimes happens, we all know that the baby is just but ugly. <laughs> what do you do? Do you say, whoa, that baby is ugly? <laughs> no, of course you don't. You make up a little white lie, don't you? You say, he looks like his father. <laughs> <laughs> or, I'm sure he'll grow into that nose. I don't know what you say. But the one thing you don't say is, my God, woman, that baby is ugly. 
You lie. It's a socially acceptable lie. In fact, it's a socially critical lie because otherwise nobody would love the baby. Ugly baby syndrome. An inventor walks up to you. Your brother-in-law walks up to you. Your cousin walks up to you. Your best friend walks up to you and says, I've invented a mat that doesn't acquire the stink of a dog. What do you say? You say, whoa, I left my wallet at home or otherwise I'd buy one too. <laughs> Ugly baby syndrome. You don't ask brothers and friends about your products. You ask strangers. You put yourself in harm's way. So I said this to him. In fact, I told him the whole ugly baby story, but that didn't get on TV. <laughs> the BBC cuts a lot out. And I said to him, you haven't actually asked anybody who matters. You haven't proved to me that the world wants it. What you need to do is you need to go to a big trade show and have a booth and let thousands of people walk by and see whether or not. I said, that's a fantastic act of discovery. Because you can set a million different price points across the course of a day. You can raise the price, you can lower it, you can do two for ones, you can get feedback on it, the color, the size, the shape. You are engaging in a fantastic feckin' fertile experiment with raw, unwashed humanity who doesn't give a shit about you but may love your product and may hate it. And if you had showed up here on Dragon's Den and you'd said, I just came back from a national dog show and thousands of dog owners, and they actually have a show like this in Britain because the British love their animals, and they walking by and they would come and, if you had come to me and said, I sold out the booth, and I, I would have to say, you're right. I'm not the person for this mat, but damn it, you're right. There's an audience, there's a market. You've discovered it, you've learned from it. And he went on to tell me that I didn't know what I was talking about, and I told him the amount of money I was therefore not going to invest. And we moved on. But this was the core question. He failed at the first barrier. What do you do that people need or want? If you can't answer that question, and the way you answer it, as I said before, is you don't tell me. You answer it by going out into the world and determining whether or not anybody needs or wants what you've got. Now, there's a lot of people who preach a lot of different startup methodologies. I preach start slow. Start by thinking. Start by observing. Start by going out into the world. So now, all my volunteers, who would like to answer the question one more time? Anybody, or have I scared the out of you? I'm actually really nice. Anybody? Who here would like to volunteer? Where are you? Is there somebody raise your hand? Here? We'll even give you a round of applause before you come up. Come stand here. What's your name? Chris. We need a mic, yellow mic. Let's see what happens. Chris. Hello? There you go. Hi, Chris. I'm Doug. Nice to meet you. As well. Um, right. Now tell everybody what your business idea is. Is it a business or a business idea? A business. Oh, even better. Uh, why don't you tell them what your business is, including me? You get one sentence. Okay, we are making Guitar Hero for real guitar, so all of you who have motivation problems to practice those beginner exercises, our game can be played with a real guitar. It makes it fun and gets you addicted. To, and while you play the game, you learn to play the guitar. That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> but let me, let me just recap. <laughs> you can't be sweating already. I haven't even asked my first 37 questions. Okay, so let me just start by recapping back. Because you, I liked the part where you said, for all you people, because I presume right there was our audience. For all you people who can't be bothered to practice your guitar, you've essentially brought Guitar Hero to the lazy. Is that correct? To the, un, yep. to the, to the unwashed masses, to, the, to, the, um, to those without adequate motivation. So they want to learn guitar, but they just can't get around to practicing it. Real guitar, they get to play a Guitar Hero-like game. Exactly. Okay, and is this out in the marketplace? Uh, yeah, you can download it right now if you want. So just out of idle curiosity, how does it work since I got a guitar over here and then you just download it which means it's solely software? Yeah, exactly. So we have this really advanced signal processing technology so that listens, listens to, to you. Yeah, right. any kind of iPad with the normal microphone there works. It's an iPad app. Right now it is, but we are working on something that should work on everyone's device, PC, smartphone, iPad, tablet, computer. How are sales going? Uh, 
pretty good so far for the first product, but uh, we knew it had its limitations. Oh, stop. What do you mean by for the first product? Uh, well, it was you mean kind of the first version or the first product. Uh, no, I think we made kind of a minimal viable product just to answer the question you just asked a bit better. Um, and at some point, everyone kept saying, "I don't care. Let me buy this product now." And people were pushing us to actually sell that thing, so we did, and that went very well. But we are now working on the on the kind of next version of of a similar product. But that kind of what's the big difference? What uh, doesn't it do now that you think it should do, such that it's going to change the arc of sales dramatically? Okay, so right now it teaches you the basics. It teaches you the basic chords and a few simple melodies that you can play. Where we don't have the technology yet that you can really rock along, you can jam, you can play these drumming patterns, rhythm exercises, and so on. Um, and those are the things we are bringing in. And people aren't buying it now because they don't have that, or they aren't advancing now because they don't have it? Uh, yeah, they are. No, no, that was a choice. You can't okay. say yeah. Uh, people are buying it right now and asking when is the update coming. Okay, so therefore you're not preventing sales. Yeah. Therefore the improvement's not going to increase sales. Uh, I hope at the same time it will. Because, because people aren't buying it because it doesn't do the advanced function, which they only find about after they've gotten to the basic function? No, I think when people find out, uh, try to find out what the game does, uh, they, some of them realize that this is not yet going to get them all the way that they want to go to. So how do you know they don't buy? Uh, I think they buy, and then they sell. In that unit. case, you're not holding back sales. You only get two choices here. Okay, I and think... what is that noise? Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah, but my, my phone is nervous. Your, your pocket was screaming at me. Um, yeah, I thought it was yours. No, it's not mine. I don't have that ringtone, dude. My ringtones don't, aren't from a horror film. Um, you caught me off guard. Um, no, this is a very interesting question to me because I'm sure the world reality is more complex than I'm giving you the freedom to express, nevertheless. Um, your concern is that you've created a minimally viable product, which may very well be the case. And your intention is to add on the more advanced capacity for somebody growing as a guitar player, which sounds like a wonderful increase in capacity. But every time we get to the question, is that the thing that's going to change the number of initial sales, I'm not clear that you're clear that it is or isn't holding back initial sales, because it appears to me that they're discovering it after they've reached the ceiling, and they reach the ceiling after they've purchased the product. And so it could be the case that they're not buying the product at all, but you just didn't say that. You said the opposite. So do you follow my concern? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, so do you actually think it's the lack of advanced functionality that's limiting your initial takeoff? There are lots of other choices. I don't know. I can't say a yes or no question. That's fine. That's a great uh, answer. Now we know what your next step is then. Yeah. We have two choices. We can go ahead and test whether or not that's the case by going ahead and asking people or finding people who are failing to buy and finding why they're failing to buy and seeing whether this remedies it. Or we can throw out some other hypotheses as to why you don't have more sales yet. You have many choices. So for example, let's talk about market reach. So question two that I generally ask is who's the customer, right? So why don't we start there? So who's the customer? Okay, the customers are, in general, all people who want to learn you to say play. you old people? All people, oh, all uh, any people person mind. who wants to learn to play the guitar. All is so much better than old. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All people who want to play the guitar. Or who want to learn to play the guitar, yeah. Isn't it actually all people who have a guitar who are already learning to play a guitar? Uh, I think the people who have a dusty guitar in the corner is one audience. Well, if they don't have a guitar, they can't use your product. Therefore, it's all people who have a guitar who want to play yeah. the guitar. There's a reason I distinct, make distinct. When you answer the question, who is the customer, you're looking for proxies to customers. You're looking for attributes of people that you can hook onto because you can only reach the people you can find. And therefore, you have to be really precise in what you're saying. So you're right. It is people who aspire to play the guitar, but that's a very big pop. And since one of the critical tools is a guitar, since you're basing it on having a guitar, people who own a guitar is better than people who don't, in theory. I suppose you could be looking for the new purchaser of a guitar. 
Uh, yeah, that's... Or sell them at the point of purchase. See, the only reason you ask the question, who's the, well, there's two reasons. One reason you ask the question, who's the customer, is because you may have more than one customer group. You may have more than one technically referred to market segment that you want to reach. Now, in your case, that's not so much of an issue. I mean, you could differentiate between people at initial point of purchase and people who've already purchased a guitar, largely because the routes to them may be different, right? And after all, what you really care about is making sure people who want or have a guitar know about you. And the universe of people who want or know about a guitar globally is very, very large. Agreed? Yep. What percentage of them do you think know about you? Uh, probably a dwindling small percentage. A, a very, very small number. Agreed? Absolutely. Right. The number one issue for most startups, the number one issue for almost every business I've started or invested in has been about reaching their customer base. The early stages of a business are constitutionally different than every other stage of a business. And the biggest issue is reaching audience. Thus, when you tell me that you're going to solve a business problem with a product solution, I worry. In other words, if your entire creative focus is on the next version of the product because you think that's automatically going to translate into sales, you're not thinking like an entrepreneur, you're thinking like an inventor. It may be the case that you need more features in your product. But I have a question for you. Do you have people who love your product? Do you have customers uh, who love it? Yeah. Right. That can, if you've got customers that love your product in a globally thin market with a web reaching every corner of the globe, then there's probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people who might love your product who simply don't know about it. And wouldn't it be more fun to sell a few million and then upgrade? That was a rhetorical question. Please say yes. Absolutely. Dude, we are now on the He's same way. so wavelength. right. But you see the problem. The problem is if all of your entrepreneurial focus, because you only have, you have no money, and you've got a lot of time. That's the entrepreneurial, con unless you've got a lot of money. Do you have a lot of money? A bit more than in the beginning, but I wouldn't call it a lot. Fair enough. Therefore, you want to husband your money and treasure it and spend it carefully. But your time, even though it may not appear that way, you've got a lot of. You have 24 hours every day. By the time Friday comes, you get two free days before the work week starts again. It's fantastic. So the question is, how do you use all that time? If you use the time and the time of how many people are you in your business? Uh, 11. Oh my goodness, there's lots of you. That's a lot. How many are programmers? How does it break down? Uh, so we have one guitar teacher um, who, who does make the exercises, one more musician who makes the songs, then we have uh, the hardcore signal processing guy making the technology so you can understand. Then we have um, one uh, lead programmer and two kind of um, additional programmers who are part-time and then two business guys and uh, community manager and two visual artists. That's more than I think 11, but that's cool. That's a whole bunch. Um, you realize your entire corporation is broken into product and business. Now, it may be, yep. it may be that the minimum necessary group of people, given what you're doing, which is artistic elements and creative elements and content elements and coding elements, it's a necessary minimum. May very well be. But right now, you're, the expenditure of money is product and business. Therefore, it's no surprise to me that if there's 11 people sitting around the room and they all have a hammer in their hand, all they're going to see is nails. Right? That's what carpenters do. I got a hammer, so what problems do I solve? I solve the problem of hitting nails. I got nine, 11 people in the room, nine of whom build product. What problem are we going to solve? We're going to build more product. Because that's how we solve problems. It lines up beautifully. The only problem is I don't think it's your problem. I don't know anything about your business. I'm speaking from that fabulous position of total ignorance. It's a place I've been many times before. <laughs> the problem I have is you've told me things that make so much sense. There's people who love your product. You have effectively no marketing budget and no marketing reach. You're a globally wide and thin audience, meaning there's people in every country of every stripe who have a guitar who've not yet learned who would love to play your product. And they don't know about you. So it seems to me yours is not a product problem. Because if tomorrow they knew about you, a certain percentage would buy and love it, just as a certain percentage love it and buy it today. So really, you don't have a big problem. You just have a hard problem. You follow the distinction. So if you, so let me ask you the next question. How do you reach them? That's question three. It's always question three. Once you tell me who they are, I want to know how you reach them. But now we're properly at that question. How do you reach them? 
D didn't I fall out the question before because I couldn't answer it properly? <laughs> uh, yes. You would generally be dead. But fortunately, you're not here for purposes of investment. You're here for purposes of education. So you never die. You're, you're stuck on this stage for years. How do you reach them? OK, we are trying out different things right now. Uh, we are, for one, bound to the App Store. And that alone doesn't work for us. Because you don't, oh, your iPad only. You're not Android or anything. No, iPad yeah, only. Fair enough. Right now, and it's uh, impossible to reach kind of the top of the charts because yep. we, we still lose a lot of people who don't have guitars. Uh, we are working on different channels. Uh, where do people actually go to discover? Where do pe people um, go when they want to learn about guitar learning? And where do they go? Uh, I think we have talked to a lot of people about this question. Uh, there is the traditional ones who kind of call the music school. Uh, there is the people who ask in the guitar store. And the big generation kind of that is coming up are the ones who type it into YouTube how to how to play guitar, how to play basic chords, how to tune a guitar. So that's and that's, and search engine optimization in general. I mean, this is kind of the ask.com, how mm -hmm. to start playing a guitar. And? Uh, these are the things that we try to address right now. So how are you going to address the direct-to-channel market for YouTube, Google SEO, and ask? What do you do? Uh, I may have an answer here, but what do you do? I think we we are increasing the visibility there, so we give the uh, give people these kind of videos that they're actually If I typed for. into YouTube tomorrow, the most fun way to learn guitar, would I find a video of somebody playing Guitar Hero or whatever your thing is called? It won't be Guitar Hero. What's your thing called? Uh, wild Chords. What's it called? Wild Chords. Wild Chords. That's great. So if I were to type into YouTube tomorrow, the most fun way to learn to play a guitar, would I find Wild Chords? I think so, yeah. Maybe not on the top rank, but... Would it be on the first page? Probably, yeah. Then in that case, you're well on your way. I think I have to draw a line right there, or else we're going to spend the whole day together. Very Ladies nice. and gentlemen, a very large round of applause for a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much. For those of you who ever have the misfortune to attend one of my one-day boot camps, what are you writing down? I'm going to write that down. Yeah. Oh, you're going to try and see what happens. Yeah, I'll be curious to know as well. Um, if you ever have the fortune, good or bad, to attend one of our one-day boot camps, our one-day boot camps are largely composed of what we call surgery. That's what we would call a surgery. Our goal is to deconstruct a business to find out what the actual challenge facing the team is at that moment in time. If it's an acting business, it's very easy because businesses start and you evolve and you start moving down a path. If it's not an acting business, it becomes somewhat hypothetical, but still very valuable. There would be still, if he hadn't started the business, there would still be lots of interesting and useful ways for him then to interrogate the real world to figure out how he would reach the market. And given the fact, I've forgotten your name, I'm sorry. Chris? Given the fact that Chris has an established business that clearly has a bit of capital behind it and has a team in play, then all the more reason they should be strategizing now about how to use their scarce time and money in order to increase the likelihood of success. It is, interestingly enough, the failure of most startups that they fail not because they run out of money, though that is the usual proximate cause of death. But that's like saying somebody's heart stopped as the reason for death when five minutes before they were hit by a bus, right? Their heart did stop. There is no doubt about it. The bus may have had something to do with it. Startups suffer the same type of death. In the early days of a business, businesses make mistakes. Those mistakes, and, and it comes in the flurry, right? You're making a thousand decisions, and those decisions come very quickly. But what happens is, every once in a while, a really big decision goes by, and you didn't notice it, and you picked the wrong answer. And amongst the many decisions you made, that one was fatal, and you find out a few minutes later when your heart stops, when you run out of cash. And you can't untwine it necessarily. So the trick of somebody trying to help you start a business is to stop you from making fatal mistakes. If you can get through that first turbulent period, odds are you'll survive. You may prosper, you may struggle, but odds are you'll survive. Therefore, as somebody in the business of helping somebody start a business, my goal is not to teach you how to win, it's to keep you from death. 
and it's to keep you from death long enough until you can win by yourself. Because largely, you will make a series of key bad decisions. And those decisions are not obvious at the point of decision making, because they're just ones of thousands. And so your goal is to understand what constitutes a key decision before it happens. There's, so you're aware, you're abraded, you're sensitive to just the same things that your business should be sensitive to. And I use the word sensitivity because that's actually the formal term used when you're doing analysis. So when you ask about a business model and you ask what is it sensitive to, you're asking about variables of the business that cause it to rise and fall. And so I want the person to be as sensitive to the variables as the business model is as sensitive to the variables, whether the person has any clue what I'm talking about or not. And the easiest way to create sensitivity is to rub them raw. There is no better way. If I rub you raw, you will be sensitive to it forevermore. So in a one-day class or a three-day class or a year-long boot camp, we will rub you raw. And we will ask you to try to dig in and find out what matters for your business. And the way you do that is you answer some questions. Because if you know who the customers are and your choice of customers, you can then make intelligent decisions as to which customer base you reach first. I'll give you an example. It is frequently the case that somebody will stand up and they'll pitch their business to me and they'll tell me that there is this huge market out there, this one market segment that's a thousand times bigger than the other market segments. And they'll say, so obviously we're going to go for the big one. There's nothing obvious about that at all. It's not the size of a market segment that makes it desirable. It's the pace of growth of a market segment that makes it desirable. I would much rather have a startup running after an incredibly small market segment that's growing at 200% a year than a market segment of any size that's not growing at all. After all, the attributes of a market segment that's not growing is there are no new customers. The attribute of a market segment that's not growing is everyone already has an incumbent and so the problem is somehow being solved or ameliorated without your intervention. Whereas in a growing market, there's new entrants who haven't solved the problem against you. You don't have an incumbent competitor. Therefore, you are on an equal playing field to win their business. Growing marketplaces like rising tides take the incompetent up with them. And guess what you are? You're the young and the incompetent. So it's your job to let everything else push you up. And so when somebody says, look, there's this huge market segment out there. We're running after it. I say, but is it growing? How can we determine if it's growing? I will take an infinitesimal fast growing market over a large market any time. It's a classic mistake, and we make it early on. We run after the alluring light, not realizing that there's a small thing that's about to become big. It's a simple mistake. It's just fatal. It's a bit of a challenge. 10 questions, 10 answers, a bit of education, and you're on your way. That's what we do at School for Startups. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. <laughs> questions? We've got time for a couple questions. Questions, comments, disagreements. I love that. I'm buying them. Dying in silence. There must be a question out there somewhere. Anybody? I can't believe it. That's a great idea. I, Let I, me go. We're going to go random. There you then. go. You've got, you've got one fellow got all one, the way in back. One, I'll wait back. Let's, Let's see you're see. throwing up. Ooh. It wasn't bad, actually. Hi. Uh, first of all, great presentation. I think we all uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, nowadays, app stores uh, put a little bit of a barrier between customers and businesses. Okay, there goes my iPhone. But uh, uh, what do you think or how have you been able to help other entrepreneurs in kind of breaking this barrier? How can we reach the customers? Because if we can't know who buys the product or actually who doesn't buy the product like you were addressing before, then it becomes a very difficult. Um, I think you have to, there, there's two forms of marketing, Jen. there's two forms of distribution even. Distribution related marketing, push and pull. Push is essentially what you're talking about. You're using the distribution channel and the fulfillment mechanism to act as your marketing tool and that's problematic. It's problematic in the physical world because you have to pay the distributor to merchandise your product. It's difficult in the app store world because there's actually not even an easy way to pay. And in the current rather lopsided draconian world we live in, where we have, one, we have a hegemony and in fact we have a single port of call, which is Apple, which has a series of practices that are not necessarily in your favor, then you can't use the app store as your mechanism to reach your customer. You have to treat it 
you do what you can to optimize it, but your marketing strategy is one of thinking of the app store as a fulfillment channel and not depending upon it as a discovery channel. You have to get outside and ask, where is the customer? And you point them towards the app store for fulfillment. You don't start with the app store for discovery. And therefore, his challenge and his opportunity will lie in bundles, in working with publishers of music, in both old and new-fashioned ways of reaching people at the point of desire, not at the point. See, a person who's learning how to play the guitar doesn't start at the Apple App Store. That's not their intuitive place to start. In fact, that's possibly the least intuitive place to start. Therefore, working on dis having discovery at the point of the App Store is a bit fruitless, isn't it? When you really want them at the point of, be of being frustrated with learning how to play a guitar. So the Google search box is a good place to start. And, th and thus we have a conversation, whether it's YouTube or Google. Those are good places to start. And thus an SEO strategy is relevant, or an SEM strategy to be more pungent. Because SEO works in a matter of months. SEM works in a matter of 24 hours. And if you have any capital at all, SEM being search engine marketing, meaning Google AdWords and the like, that can be an incredibly effective strategy for a startup if they get their act together. And that's something, were we spending more time together, or were I an investor in his business, I'd be all over him like a wet blanket working with him on it. And the great thing about that is, do you know what you get in an SEM strategy? You get one sentence. One sentence to describe your business. And it's just about the length of a Google AdWords box. What a thing. Yeah, so in, in that sense, do you feel that uh, businesses that are built directly on the web, which is more of bi-directional, or provides a more of a bi-directional channels for you to learn about your customers even before they engage with your product, uh, do you feel that those services or businesses nowadays have, a, a, let's say, a higher degree of success, or it just doesn't matter, you just have to do it? It's just a changing landscape. The other thing that I probably should bring up is he should socialize his successes and he should encourage socialization of successes. So there's different types of coding you can engage in, and we didn't really get to that challenge. But the wonderful thing about a software business is everything is code. Marketing is code, development is code, but it's all code, actually. And so I would challenge his development plan and ask, why is he not coding for marketing? Why is he coding for features? In other words, when somebody plays, is there gamification layers? And if there are gamification layers and they win, can they post it against their friends so their friend knows that they've won? How do I socialize the fact that I'm playing it all? Because the coolest thing to do is to let their friends know that I'm playing this at all. Well, that's code. But that means it's development. That means it's on your development schedule. Well, is the development for making money higher than the development for making the next feature? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, it's all code when you're a software company. And the marketing code is represented less than the cool new feature code. Because there's more people in the business who care about it. And if you look at his business, just the architecture of the business has people who care about the product more than they care about the business. And that's not a bad thing. It may be a minimum necessary thing, but therefore you have to intentionally offset it. Because it's all code in his business, marketing or not. I don't think it makes any difference whether it's a web business or not. The same principles apply. Thank you for asking the question. No problem. Any other questions? Yes. Whoa! I love your microphone. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Dong from Tega Silicon Valley. Uh, you started in the beginning that saying you will tap into that, that ideas are cheap at the end of the day. So. But I then forgot about it. Yeah. yeah. So interesting to hear more about that since in Silicon Valley all the entrepreneurs are sharing their ideas. Not that much in Finland. So just hear your insight about why the ideas um, are cheap at the end of the day. Right, so there's, there's a slight tension here, but it kind of goes like this. A, as a rule, there are very few unique ideas. If you're having an idea, there, what, bear in mind that ideas don't happen in the absence of provocation. Ideas happen because something happens to you. A circumstance happens, a problem happens. The world sort of impacts upon you. It is largely the case that that is happening somewhere else at the same time. There are lead, lead, lead sorry. There are legions of instances of simultaneous discovery. Over and over and over again, if something, if you're having an idea, odds are reasonably good it's happening in a lot of places. It just so happens there's only a few places where ideas get turned into businesses. So there's actually, they're not as broad as they should be. The distribution of intelligence around the world is infinite. The distribution of creativity is infinite. And certainly the distribution of provocative problems is everywhere. What isn't equal 
is the opportunity to take advantage of those ideas. Innovation is equally expressed. The opportunity to act on innovation is not. We don't have the rule of law. We don't have the rule of contracts. We don't have equal distributions of availability to capital ecosystem and support around the world. So a lot of people have fertile ideas in unfertile ground. So you can don't worry about that. But then there's a lot of other people who have an idea and they don't even realize it was an idea they had. They, go, they brush it off and they keep on going with their life. In fact, most of the people who have good ideas never know they've had an idea in their life. And we can wor not worry about them. Now, there's a subset of people who had your idea who are probably thinking I should do something about it, but they don't get around to it. There's people you could tell the idea to who say, that's a fantastic idea, I'll act on it, but don't get around to it. In fact, the mass majority of people won't get around to it. In fact, the people who get around to it will do it wrong. And they'll do it wrong, and they'll do it late, and they'll do it slow. And in fact, very few people are going to do anything with your idea because they've got ideas of their own. And the ones who are inclined to act on it like their ideas more than yours. And the ones who are going to act on it and act on your idea are probably going to do it differently than you did it. But let's say you share your idea. Let's say you talk to other people about it. Well, why would you do that? Well, I don't know. I got 10 questions to answer. How can I do the, answer those questions if I don't share my idea? How can I find out what the world thinks if I don't ask the world what it thinks? How can I design the business around the idea if I don't work on it by going out and discovering all the things I need to know? The upside of sharing is greater than the downside risk of theft, would be my assertion. And the problem is, I have ideas every day. And now, when I was young, I was sort of a ready, fire, aim sort of guy, right? Turns out that's the wrong order. Now, I'm a ready, lie down, take a nap, get over it, get up, move on to the next idea. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, in, in, a, in a lifetime of ideas, I've only tried seven. You know, and six of them were better than bad, and one of them sucked really bad. Um, that's my thoughts on ideas. Okay. Question? Yes, sir. That was very gentle. Hi, I'm, I'm Olaf, working for Astronomer Games. Um, I'm curious about um, a thing that I've been thinking about in terms of like deriving a business idea through really methodology or methodological ways of analyzing this and that and putting together, you know, this should work versus uh, what I'm thinking of as more of a psychological innovation. Um, in, for instance, penny auctions and payday loans that came to Finland quite a few years ago now, uh, that basically would not have come out of any sort of um, methodological analysis. If you put down on a paper, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a loan and charge you 1,200% interest rate for poor people who can't pay back, and it would actually become a 150 million euro business in Finland only. Nobody would ever have thought that that would work. That just kind of emerged. Really? This is this no, is just, this sorry, is like what again? You, Olaf. Olaf. Let, let's unwind it. Let me phrase it differently. Okay. Sure. I go to work. I work. I get a paycheck. My paychecks. I put. I look at it. I stick it in the bank, and I start spending money. And I'm going to get another paycheck in 30 days, but I run out on 21. Shit, I'm broke. Okay. That is an obvious problem. Can I solve the problem? Yeah. I'll give you money for nine days. Great, I won't charge you much. I'll charge you 20 quid for it. Turns out to be 1,200% a year because the amount I lent was so small that anything I charge is going to be high. <coughs> Payday loan. Obvious problem, obvious solution. It's been around forever. Literally, it's been around forever. It's called lending money. Yep. And let me well, tell you, it's yeah, been around true. forever. But the notion that, it, it, that, it, that, it, that it's, it couldn't have been thought through in a logical process, I would have debated. So I'm well, not sure, yeah, may, but you may have a great idea, but the wrong fact set. So let's not worry about the example. Go back to the question. Again. Yeah, so, but yeah, that was like just one sort of maybe example, maybe not of it. But, yeah, but, that's a but like example. if you take the Instagrams and all these that, I don't know how, okay. how these guys thought that, okay, this will be a killer idea, but it just somehow emerged. So um, what I would like to ask is with all these startups you work with, how many do actually do comp end up doing something completely different through this type of discovery? Well, this oh, I see what you're asking. Um, well, is John Mullins in the room? John, just stand up for a second so people can admire the author of Plan B. He's written a book on the subject. You owe me. Um, um, 
So many times it happens that people start down one course and have to shift tremendously during the oper early operating days of a business that John has both an observed and analyzed that phenomenon and written a book called Plan B, which is the colloquial term for the one you end up with except the one you started. I think he's being quite generous. I've been all the way down to the letter M with some businesses before we discovered our actual business model. And the fact of the matter is I view that now as being in my more mature years as being a natural part of the evolution of a startup. That as you're going through it, you're discovering business models, you're learning about, it, and it's almost inevitable. So the vast majority of businesses that I'm involved with and have been involved in my life ended up in places where they didn't start. It is natural and it's inevitable, and thus I find it all the more peculiar that people teach businesses, young businesses, stick to your knitting, go to the goal, ignore the world, that's what you're doing, stay pure, give me a break. You have to be deeply sensitive to the world around you. John, are you going to? Whoa. Uh, isn't this cool? So, some, some data. We, we run a course at London Business School where students come with ideas that they think are, at least on day one, really good ideas. Uh, this process has, over the last 10 years, produced more than 200 businesses. But two-thirds of those businesses were not the idea they came in with on day one. Right. So they finished the process and figured out, yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I'm sure glad it's not this idea I'm going to pursue. And even if it is the same idea, this, it's, they still end up at plan B. Yeah, it changes. So it changes. your idea is going to change. And, and discovery, Doug's point, is the way it's going to change. He knows what he's talking about. Yes, sir. All the way in back. Good luck. John's got a hell of an arm. Um, we have a major problem in Silicon Valley called um, essentially social media, big data, gaming, whatever. Mobile apps sucking up increasing amounts of capital. And what is, what is happening is we're seeing less and less capital percentage-wise going to uh, medical devices and non-ICT IT companies. Um, and a lot of the questions we see here, for example, and around the world in communities that are developing mobile apps are around consumer, consumer plays. Mm. How does your methodology uh, address enterprise plays? What are the major differences between selling enterprise and consumer? Because enterprise is really critical for clean tech, uh, other key areas, energy, environmental technologies, a lot of which Finland has, other European countries, nanotech, for example, that are having a, a real hard time getting to market. Uh, it, it's a really interesting question, larger than my method, to be honest, though I'm very simple. Whoa, dude, that's how important it is. Um, I mean, I come out, I live in Cambridge, England, the other Cambridge, um, and of course, that Cambridge is also very much more about biotech, medical devices, and silicon than it is about the web. Um, and I was part of an angel group there, and to be honest, I don't even know what we're talking about half the time when we hear pitches. Um, the same method applies, right? Because my method is only as good as the evaluation of a business, not as the merits of that business as compared to other businesses, if that makes sense. And so it's only limited to asking, can this be a wonderful business and what size and shape? What you're really asking is a much more interesting question on another level, and that is, what do we do about the irrational, faddish flow of capital in the VC industry? But VCs, remember, I have hold them in disdain, never forget. And that part of that disdain is that they, I used to call them carnivorous sheep, right? They only follow, but they're so aggressive when they get there, right? The fact of the matter is, it's actually a very uncommon venture firm that will stray away from the obvious gleaming thing in front of them. And you know, the, probably know the, the, the percentages of return in venture as well as I do. The top decile produces the vast percentage of all the return globally. You've got a huge amount of return coming from very few firms in the US and everyone else follows and most of them make no money at all and Europe is languishes so far behind on venture return as to be a problem. Now mind you, I think that there's great prospects for venture investment in Europe. But I think there's great, I, you know, I'm obviously an optimist, I'm an angel investor. I can't possibly be rational, right? Or else I wouldn't continue to spend my children's inheritance. But 
Your question is actually deeper than that, and that is, how do you find ways for the enterprise plays to make money when everyone's running after apps? Because that's largely what you're really asking. And the answer is, it is a brutal, ugly system that is far too oligopolized for that to have a satisfactory answer. Because what will happen is the current wave will crash and burn, the money will be lost, and it will shift to another area. And thus, enterprise will come back up. I would assert that med and bio are somewhat immune to this condition because you have a separate tranche of firms that are specialists too, especially biotech and med tech. And so the total distribution is much more sluggish because the limiteds move at a much more limited pace, if that makes sense. But I don't think you can cure the problems of venture capital, certainly not through my small method. Yay. Hi, Doug. Uh, what role does culture of customers uh, play in a business model? What Regarding role the, does the culture of the customers play in the business yeah. model? For Did example, you, in the marketplace, if you want to if you want to sell it through the web or to real customers who are somewhere else, as compared to Europe, if your customers are in Asia or U.S. So, do you mean the role of the culture or the location? I think it's both. Right, because people do behave differently in terms of their purchasing habits and stuff like that. Well, I think there's, I think there's a logistical question, there's a cultural question, right? So the use of credit cards is not evenly distributed across the world, for example. Yeah. And if you're going to set up, if you're, as I've seen many small businesses in California do, they set up the whole world thinking it all looks like the U.S. And they just assume we all have credit cards and everyone uses credit cards. And you and I both know you have a radical redistribution. And in fact, there's businesses that have done very, very well in emerging markets in particular because they've been sensitive to purchase systems and behaviors in emerging markets in particular. So I think the logistical sensitivity to the ha habits of people is profound to your business model, especially if your business model is depending upon reaching market segments in, say, a developing country. The cultural question is slightly more elusive because I have made many mistakes in this area. Um, I started a tragedy of a company a number of years ago that was in the mobile software space just before the release of the iPhone. If you want to know what bad timing looks like, that would more or less be it. We burned a good seven million pounds on this business. So it was a proper, you know, Orwellian nightmare for Doug. Um, but not, you know, I'm not bitter. And uh, <laughs> what's interesting though is we had a huge take up in Indonesia, India, Pakistan, um, most of Eastern Africa, because we were we had created. I mean, it's not really worth going into the details, but our it wasn't intentional. But when we backed out of what we had done to understand why we were picking up the market there, it's because we were offering an opportunity for people there on non-smartphones that didn't matter to somebody in the U.S. U.K. but mattered tremendously to them. Now they were a slightly unmonetizable audience, which mattered to us, right? So I found a gap in the market. I just didn't find a profit in the gap. Shame. So yeah, the cultural sensitivities are huge. I wish I'd thought of them before I'd started that business. Beyond that, yeah, I mean, is it any, but is that any different than a mar any market segment analysis, really? You know, take into account the customer you're actually aiming for and know them for what they are and know the path to them and understand what their sensitivities are. You know, if I'm gonna, I'll start a dating site here but I'll probably start a marriage arranging site in India that actually is a dating site in disguise, right? Self-help Yenta. Yeah, I wouldn't call it that. Because there's not much Yiddish in India, but leaving that aside. I think we better end on that question before I go downhill. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Sir.